Excellent. At this point, I'd like to invite Kate Markert, Hillwood's Executive Director, to come on and introduce tonight's program. Thank you, Erin. Good evening, I'm Kate Markert. I'm Executive Director here at Hillwood Estate Museums and Gardens in Washington, DC. My pronouns are she and her. Thank you for inviting us into your homes this evening. As we begin, I would like to take a moment to gratefully acknowledge the Nakach Tank, also documented as the Anacostan, the Piscataway, and the Pamunkey. Those are the native peoples on whose ancestral lands Hillwood stands, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their homes near us today. You may know that Hillwood closes each January for a deep cleaning. As a result, February might just be the best time of the year to visit when the mansion is absolutely spectacular. We reopened our doors this weekend with both new and continuing community health guidelines. The district requires masks for all indoor locations and Hillwood now requires proof of vaccination for all visitors over 12. In just under two weeks, our newest exhibition, The Luxury of Clay, Porcelain Past and Present, will open on Saturday, February 19th. I know that many of you are already Hillwood members and please know how much I appreciate your ongoing support. Members in the DC area are invited to preview the luxury of clay next week. We will be open until 7 p.m. on both Wednesday, February 16th and Thursday, February 17th, exclusively for members. So if you have not yet become a Hillwood member, I highly encourage you to do so. Another wonderful benefit to membership is free access to our virtual programming, which is particularly robust this spring. I hope all of you will be with us over the next four weeks as we continue the Great Homes and Garden series. On Wednesday, February 16th, award-winning garden designer, Carolyn Mullet leads us through private havens in Europe. The following Wednesday, we'll hear from Jane S. Day, the author of From Palm Beach to Shangri-La, The Architecture of Marion Sims Wyeth. And finally, on Wednesday, March 2nd, nationally acclaimed interior designer, Corey Damon Jenkins, focuses on bold, innovative design techniques to end our series. You can learn more about our upcoming programs and register at hillwoodmuseum.org. I want now to share just a few practical reminders about how tonight's virtual lecture will work. Your cameras and microphones are off, so please make yourself comfortable. We still wanna hear from you. Please say hello and tell us where you're viewing from using the chat. And finally, submit your questions using the Q&A module, which of course is separate from the chat, as they cross your mind. We will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the program. It is now my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Hilton Carter is a director, editor, and fine artist who simply loves making things. He is passionate about plants, and has a loyal following on Instagram where he shares his knowledge of plant care and styling. A Baltimore native, Hilton's passion for the arts developed at an early age. He began taking summer art classes at the local community college when he was just nine years old. After high school, Hilton earned his bachelor's of fine arts from the Maryland Institute College of Art and a Master's of Fine Arts from the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. His freelance work as a filmmaker and editor allowed him to travel around the US. In 2014, Hilton was in New Orleans and looking for a practical way to create privacy in his apartment without hanging curtains. He purchased a fiddly fig named Frank, 
which flourished in the bright and humid conditions. Eight years later, Frank is still thriving in the Baltimore apartment he shares with Hilton and his wife, Fiona, their impeccably styled five-month-old daughter, Holland, cats, Isabella and Zoe, pup, Charlie, and 200 other plants. In addition to Wild at Home, Hilton is the author of Wild Creations, inspiring projects to create plus plant care tips and styling ideas for your own wild, and Wild Interiors, beautiful plants in beautiful spaces, all of which are available both online and in person at our museum shop. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Hilton Carter. Hello. Um, it's uh, so great to be here with all of you. I wish it was in person, but it just so happens to be virtual, which is fine. I mean, I'm sure plenty of you are used to this sort of setting. Um, it is good to be able to uh, do an event like this uh, with everyone from my new home here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Kate, thank you for such a great intro. Um, my daughter is uh, hopefully going to sleep now, but if you do hear uh, her, uh, I apologize. But hey, what am I going to do? I'm at home. <laughs> so that's what's happening around here. You won't hear from my plants. You might hear from my pup. Uh, he's a big dog, so he makes a lot of noise walking around. But I'm sure a lot of you understand that and uh, you'll be fine with it. But tonight I'm excited because I get to talk uh, to so many wonderful plant uh, lovers out there, whether it's indoor or outdoor uh, plant lovers. I'm mainly an indoor plant lover. Um, we just re recently purchased a home. So uh, we are now getting our fingers a bit dirty in the outdoor space, but uh, indoor plant care and plant styling is what I'll be talking about. So that's why I call today's uh, lecture Getting Wild at Home. Obviously I have a book, Wild at Home, uh, but Wild in the Home is what we are gonna be talking about tonight. I know a lot of you uh, are trying uh, your best at this time of the year to make sure all of your plant friends that you brought in over the spring and summer of last year can stay alive. It's a, it's a difficult, uh, I would say, challenge for a lot of uh, newbies when it comes to uh, winterizing your plants and making sure that they get the proper light, the proper moisture, all those things once uh, winter hits. So uh, if there are questions on that, maybe uh, you can put those in the Q&A. But um, I'm going to be talking mainly about uh, styling, but a lot I would say I'm going to force the care portion first because that is important. You can't party uh, without, uh, you know, bringing in the decorations or having the party snacks, right? You got to make sure everything is uh, set up first for you before you can start bringing plants in. So I'm going to talk a bit about that as well. Now, for me, the spaces that I tend to uh, style have a more lush, I will say, mood to them. That's uh, something that I particularly love, but not everyone has the right type of light for that or big windows to create that sort of space. And I try to tell everyone that while Kate did say I have 200 plus plants in my home, that doesn't mean that that number is something that everyone should um, be inspired to uh, bring into their own home. Uh, one plant, one single plant can change a space, can make a space feel more alive and more lush. It doesn't take 200. But if you are someone who is pushing and hoping to uh, have a space that is full of plants, I hope that you spend the time, figure out um, what is needed for those plants to live first. And the one thing I tell folks, uh, when it comes to care is that you always want to make sure that you find a spot in your home where a plant can thrive and not just survive. And I know a lot of individuals uh, in the plant community who go out to find a plant that they truly love. And that happens to be uh, something that they just think somewhat, they think look 
they, they think it looks pretty or they think they like the, the, the shape or the style of the foliage and they want to just force it into their homes without thinking about the, the necessary uh, light or care that that plant needs first. So while it is, it is uh, exciting to be able to do something like you see here on the left, which is basically a um, <laughs> plant chandelier is what I call it, but it's a, a canoe full of plants uh, or to the um, uh, right here where you have an apartment that is full of different sorts of tropical plants. It's important to think about the care that's going to go into that, those plants. It's, it's important to figure out what type of light is necessary for all of those plants, what type of individual you might be, uh, whether that's someone who is very focused on care or someone who considers himself an individual who has a brown thumb. You want to make sure that you have the ability to care for these plants first before you rush to style them in your home. Now, before we get to the, 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 the goodness, uh, the excitement of styling, like I said, we want to talk about care. And the one thing I, I uh, have a chapter on in my recent book, Wild Creations, is the power of light. And when it comes to plants, light is everything to every single plant. And before you rush out to a plant shop to bring home a plant in your home, for me, the best thing to do is I always make sure that if I'm gonna bring home a new plant first, I have to have that discussion with my wife. We already have too many plants and uh, she won't, uh, I, think she was, I think she's gone. <laughs> she won't let me bring in many more. But if I do wanna bring home a new plant, I do have the discussion with her. Hey. I wanna bring home this plant. She asks why, I say, because I need it. She says, do you really need it? And then I say, yes, I need it. And then I figure out where in the home it needs to go. And that need is gonna be based on the light that is coming into that particular type of spot. So let's say I wanna put a, a plant in my kitchen window. First, I think about the direction that window is facing. So if it's a north, west, east, or south facing window, I then decide based on that type of exposure that's going to be coming into that spot in my home, what types of plants can thrive in that spot. So let's say I have a northern facing window, but I really want to put, we talked about Frank, my fiddle leaf fig, I really want to put a fiddle leaf fig uh, in that spot in my home that has a northern, that northern facing window. I would be doing that particular plant, that fiddle leaf fig, and injustice by putting it in a, in a spot in my home that doesn't get the type of light that that plant needs, the type of bright exposure that that plant needs. So I would probably wanna force it or push it into maybe a Southern face window or an Eastern face window to give it the best type of quality of life. So that's the thing you wanna always do. You wanna make sure you find that light. And you wanna think about the types of light there is, whether it's bright, indirect light, indirect light, low light, direct sun, and understanding what that type of, I would say, exposure can do to some of your plants. When you think about direct sun, uh, hopefully all of you who are, are here today, you understand that you know plants love the sun like we all do, but is it direct sun that they all love? That is not the case, especially when it comes to your indoor plants and in your home. A lot of these plants don't want direct sun, they want exposure of light. So uh, when we're talking about bright indirect light, most of your plants will thrive in bright indirect light, uh, medium to low light. There are particular plants out there that can tolerate low light. There's no single plant I think that loves low light. They only tolerate it, but there's a lot of shade lovers, like they say, they love shade, but that's shade as in a brighter exposure, but not direct sun. And when it comes to direct sun, a lot of your plants you want to avoid uh, pushing them towards the rec sun because they can't, that type of exposure can burn the foliage of your plants. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this happen on some of those plants you have forced into those western facing windows. It can burn the foliage of your plants and then kill the, the leaves over time. Uh, so if you do have, let's say, a spot in your home, uh, let's say leaning the western facing windows, that uh, have that sort of hot, hot sun. If you do have a spot like that in your home and you're someone who really wants to put plants in that particular area of your home, you wanna look at plants that love that sort of hot desert type sun. So maybe desert types of plants. Maybe you wanna look at a um, 
cactus, any, any cactus, you might want to think about that. You, wanna, you might want to think about those succulents that you love or your snake plants or your ponytail palm. Any of these plants that love direct sun, that western facing exposure that kind of gets a little bit, well, really hot come spring and summer, you want to make sure that you are properly preparing your plants um, and making sure that they get the best type of light for them to survive. Now, I put in here measurements because you can uh, measure how much exposure is coming into your home. Uh, the quick thing I want to talk about, I want to, I want to say for a second here, is the idea that um, when it comes to measuring the, the I, I guess the distance from your window back, um, it's one of those things that uh, you kind of have to sort of be in the game for a while to understand that. It's kind of like um, uh, my mom, I'll bring up my mom right now. <laughs> my mom was a, a, a huge, um, uh, I would say, uh, connoisseur of uh, fruit picking. <laughs> she, 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 had a, she had a thing for knowing what type of, uh, knowing when a fruit was perfect to bring home from the grocery store. She would pick it up, she would smell it, she would, <laughs> she would shake it, she would tap on it, and she would know exactly what, when that fruit was ready to bring home. And that's kind of what it's like when you're talking about measuring the light uh, that's coming into your space. So if you're in, in front of a window and you're trying to figure out how much light is coming into that home, the one thing when it comes to understanding this is understanding exposure. So we talked about bright and direct light. Now, some of you might not understand bright and direct light. Bright and direct light is, uh, imagine um, uh, the, the sun. The sun is my fist of the sun. And then imagine below the sun is uh, just a bed of clouds. And below the clouds basically is us, right? So that those clouds, they create that filter that then creates nothing but bright and direct light for the source that is below it, right? So for most individuals, for most plants, any plant that is basically near a window and that plant can look out of that window and see the sky, but isn't seeing the sun, that plant is getting bright and direct light. That is important to understand. Again, like I said, all plants can thrive in bright and direct light. So if you push a plant somewhere in your home, let's say you put it here, I'm in my kitchen right now. If I put my plant here and I look out of my uh, southern face window and I can see that that plant can see the sky but isn't seeing the sun, I know it's in bright and direct light. Now, when I talk about measurements, people who are, uh, I would say, very, if they consider themselves having green thumbs, they can just go, you know what? From that distance from the window, so about five feet back, anywhere between the window itself to five feet back is going to be bright and direct light. Anywhere from five feet to 10 feet back will be um, indirect to medium light. And anywhere from 10 feet to complete darkness will be obviously low light and darkness. And I will say this here, if any of you are placing your plant in darkness, how dare you? That's not a thing that plant lovers do. We want to make sure that our plants are getting proper light first. So like my mom, I feel like I can uh, uh, knock on the fruit, listen to the fruit, smell the fruit to get a better sense of if it's ripe or not. But when it comes to light, understanding that distance of where I'm placing my plants and how much exposure it's getting, I have that, that sense. But if you're someone who doesn't have that sense, you don't feel that confident in understanding how much exposure is coming into your home, I like to suggest light meters. And when it comes to watering your plants and not understanding when to give your plants water, I suggest moisture meters. Whatever is going to help you give that plant the best life possible, go and get it. Um, that is important. And if you are putting your plants in dark spots in your home, I do hope you have art artificial lighting. They make so many wonderful uh, grow lights out there. Making sure that you bring a grow light in for a darker spot in your home or uh, that little jungle that you're trying to create in your basement that doesn't have any windows. Uh, making sure that you have artificial light will be very important for that uh, process for those plants to actually grow. And right now, during the winter, I have artificial lights um, going for some of my plants that were outside that now need to come inside because I don't have as much space as I, as I do, as I did for these plants to grow and thrive. So because it's winter and the sun isn't as high, 
throughout the day and it isn't giving you as much exposure, you have to start thinking about providing them with that light. And if you uh, go out and purchase a, a, a grow light, more than likely it'll tell you exactly uh, how many hours and the distance it needs to be from your plant. But I will say across the board, you wanna think about giving, giving that plant at least 12 to 16 hours of that artificial light a day to make sure that it can thrive. Now, I wanna talk really quick, just so you guys have a quick understanding of plant. If you are in a spot where you don't have a lot of light or you're just a beginner, these are some of my favorite plants that can tolerate low light. You have your golden pothos, honestly, your pothos family, silver pothos, your jade pothos, your, um, your uh, um, satin pothos, any of these uh, marble queen pothos, any of those pothos, neon pothos. <laughs> There's so many pothos out there. I can't stop talking about them. I apologize. But yes, any of those pothos that are out there in the world, um, you can bring those into your home uh, in those low light areas. They can tolerate that light. Uh, your peace lilies are great. I love a good peace lily, especially in the darker corner. I love a peace lily because the peace lily, and I, I think the pothos, the philodendron family as well. I love plants that talk to you, tell you kind of what they need, especially when it comes to moisture. Uh, so the peace lily will faint, it'll drop its leaves just like this when it's ready for some moisture. But of course you want to hit that before it gets to that point because once your leaves faint, that is a plant telling you, screaming out, hey, I really am thirsty. So I uh, love I love a good peace lily. Understand that when I talk about the peace lily being in low light, it can tolerate that light. But all of those wonderful, beautiful blooms that uh, the peace lily can produce, you won't see as many of them if it is in lower light. So please understand that as well. When it comes to blooming plants, a lot of these plants that you are bringing into your homes are flowering plants. They actually do flower, but because they're not getting as much light as they do out in the natural elements outside, uh, they don't bloom as much. So if you give a piece of lily a lot of light, you will then see it bloom. So just be aware of that. Chinese evergreen, so many different uh, varieties. I would say in the Chinese evergreen family, rattlesnake calathea, honestly, there are a few calathea that can tolerate lower, lower bits of light. They are a bit more, I would say, hands-on. Uh, they demand a bit more of your attention, but they can tolerate low light. Uh, but if you're a beginner, I don't think that plants like uh, uh, calatheas that require a lot of moisture are plants that you should stay away from if you're a beginner of plants. A plant that wants you to come back to it and water it maybe every day, every other day, might be better for someone who is just starting off because they now know that they have to be on this particular type of schedule versus a snake plant, which a lot of us uh, push out there as the uh, plants for newbies. A snake plant. You water it every two to three weeks in spring and summer and come winter, you're watering every four to five weeks. And who knows, you might forget at that point in time. So it's probably, it's easier, I'll say, to kill um, a plant that doesn't require your attention as much than it is a plant that really wants your attention. I uh, love a good dumb cane. Uh, dumb cane is one of those plants that tends to be handed down from, from family member to family member. They're pretty easy to propagate. They grow pretty quickly and uh, they can tolerate low, lower amounts of light. And again, the bottom two here, ZZ plant, your snake plants, they're just known to be those plants that uh, you can push around into lower light spots in your home. They also don't require a lot of attention when it comes to moisture. So um, just be aware of that. But again, when it comes to light, plants thrive in light. The more exposure they get, the more they grow and thrive. So when you're pushing these plants that I'm talking about here, into those darker spots in your home, you probably won't see them grow a ton in those areas, but they will tolerate it and they will stay uh, alive. It just won't, they just won't be living their best lives. But if you're someone like me and you fill your home with a lot of plants, some plants just have to take a hit for the other plants in the home uh, in that situation. So uh, just be aware of that. Now, but it comes to style. So you, you, you got you to break down of how to think about light. Because that's the first thing you want to think about when it comes to bringing home a plant. You just don't want to willy-nilly push a plant anywhere into your home just because you are you have a corner in your home that needs a plant. You're like, I'm just going to grab one. You need to make sure first that you know what type of light you're getting. Now, for me, using the vertical <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing at this, but when I think about it, I only thought to use a vertical space because there was a point 
uh, in my life that I hadn't used up all the available horizontal space, all available floor space in my home. Yeah, I used it all up. My, well, at least my wife told me that. <laughs> she was like, you've used all the floor space. There's no more room in this home for plants. And I was like, what about the walls? How about we go vertical? How about we, how about we push it upwards? Um, thankfully, she didn't leave me then, but um, she was on board uh, to go vertical. And in this image behind what you're seeing there is like here to the left here, an image of a propagation wall, which basically could be a living wall as well. Um, in my old apartment, also in this, uh, I guess our new home, we also have a propagation wall, but in our old apartment, what I loved about this was the idea that not only was I able to create a living wall, greenery um, on uh, this particular wall in our home, but that living wall becomes living art, right? And that's what uh, I find very beautiful about taking greenery and placing it up on a wall. It now presents itself not just as a plant, but now as art. Now, when it comes to the propagation wall, um, there were there was a discussion of maybe creating a living wall, but utilizing uh, some sort of water filters and things of this nature, but we were renting. So that was out of the question. So uh, having the ability to take cuttings and place them into um, uh, test tubes made more sense because now we're not damaging anything really. We're just putting holes in the wall that in drywall that can be patched up later. Um, but not only were we able to take cuttings of plants that we had, or we could take cuttings from our friend's plants, but we were able to grow our plant family, let's say, through this process. Not only that, we were able to provide others, uh, friends, family members with gifts if they came over to our home. So what we did was we would always um, keep a stack of small uh, pots, planters, just in case a friend came over and they saw a cutting in the wall that they didn't have or they wanted to take home. And we would pull it out of the wall, pot it in soil, and they could walk home with a gift. Now, I will say this, um, those who know me, family members, friends, they did find out quickly that if they ever invited my wife and I to any sort of party, housewarming, birthday party, holiday party, we were coming with a gift and that gift would be a plant, a cutting from our wall. So if you're someone who uh, doesn't think money grows on trees, that whole wall was nothing but, you know, saved us a lot of money. <laughs> uh, but our friends respected it. And I will say this, the, the, the way I got into caring for plants and loving plants was through propagation. Propagation is literally the gift that keeps on giving. It is so powerful. I'm sure a lot of you uh, have a cutting from someone that you love, who loves you, and you do whatever possible to make sure that that plant stays alive because of the meaning behind it, because of the individual who gifted it to you. So when it comes to us giving those cuttings to friends, uh, they really um, did love it, and uh, I hope uh, most of them still have those those plants. Now, for the image on the right, that is a macho fern sitting in a plant hammock. Uh, in my book, Wild at Home, I actually have uh, the plant hammock as a DIY project for all of you to try at home uh, so that you can push a plant higher into your space. When it came to the that plant hammock, I wanted something that felt almost like uh, a staghorn fur, something that's kind of melted on the wall, but I also wanted to be something that sat above our bed to pull me back into my, my hope, my wish, I'll say, to surround myself in nature, whether that's, whether that's uh, uh, a glorified version of uh, glamping here, <laughs> camping in a glamorous way, um, but it was one of those things that we, just enjoy the idea of having uh, plants surround us, not only at the floor level, not only at the medium space level, but also above. When it comes to uh, bringing in plants, when it comes to styling a space with plants, I always talk about, I, I tend to talk about the idea of thinking about how nature is outdoors. When you're out in nature, there's greenery hitting you from every single level, uh, every single level. There's the grass below your feet. There's the tree that's in front of your face or the plant that's in front of your face. And there's also the trees that are above. And I feel like when you create that sort of 
um, space in your home, it makes the, the viewer, the guest, let's say, even yourself, when you enter into the space, it pulls your eye all across the room. So instead of just looking at eye level, you're now looking up at maybe that plant that is sitting uh, on a stool or sitting above a bed like this and getting more of that space. So when it comes to um, utilizing the vertical space, you're not only giving yourself more room uh, to get wild, to bring more plants in, but you're also giving your, your, your plants a opportunity to grow maybe trail or cascade down a wall or a bookshelf, or you are not someone who <laughs> thinking about bringing in live plants because you just don't have the ability to take care of plants. And I do want to uh, say really quick, um, it's not everyone's duty to be uh, the best at plant care. It's not everyone's uh, goal to understand exactly how much light is coming into their home and properly repot or water plants, but everyone deserves that feeling, that connection with nature. Um, and a lot of people want that. And they, they bring in plants and they, and they kill plants because they don't know exactly how to properly care for them or they don't have a, a, a ton of light and that just makes their plants suffer and die. But there's opportunities in here, there's a jungle mural, but also I'll say in faux plants. I know that um, it's almost taboo, taboo in some sort of ways for individuals who, are, um, who love plants to bring in faux plants. But for me, I say everyone has, everyone deserves the, the comfort, the feeling of being surrounded by nature, even if it isn't uh, real, it can bring that sort of connection, that sort of memory. That's what, um, that's how I actually go about bringing plants into my home. I try to connect them to a memory or a moment in my life that uh, was uh, surrounded in happiness. So palms and fiddle leaf figs, monsteras, uh, cacti, things, those types of plants that I've seen while I was on some sort of vacation or some trip or work, whatever it was that brought me happiness. If I'm in my home and maybe let's say it happens, um, a bit, uh, a dark cloud kind of makes its way over top of me. I can look at that monstera and think about when I was in Tulum uh, and I saw all those monsteras there because I actually got married in Tulum. And I can think about how beautiful uh, that ceremony was and how uh, beautiful my wife was um, then and now, if she can hear me. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it brings those connections. And that's why a lot of folks, if they, if they work in, let's say, a dark office or cubicle or all these different spaces where they don't have a, a instant connection to the outside world or not a lot of light is coming into the office, that's why a ton of individuals will have a screensaver that's of the beach, <laughs> it's of a tropical space, because it connects them back to that wonderful uh, moment when they were there or their wants, their human uh, nature of, of getting out and being uh, connected to being one with uh, nature is there. So when it comes to, let's say you have a dark uh, room in your home or you're just someone who doesn't have a lot of understanding on care and just don't have the time to care for plants, maybe thinking about a jungle mural uh, to help you uh, provide that sort of greenery in uh, that particular spot in your home or your office or uh, wherever you uh, need that lift. Um, I talked about the staghorn fern, any mounted plant to me, is just a way to, uh, again, bring the plant off the floor, put it on the wall, but it also breaks up let's say that gallery wall that you have of your art, it also brings a living element uh, to that space as well. And uh, to me, the Staghorn Fern is probably one of the most unique, um, the most uh, in incredible types of plants out there that I love to bring into my home. And then now, I don't know if you can see it, but behind me back here, there's a, a bunch of mounted plants uh, on the wall as well. So. That's something to think about. There's there's plant shelfies. I'm sure a lot of you have thought about all the plant shelfies uh, you you could possibly create in your home, giving your 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 plants a space, uh, a place to go to just again get off the floor is important. And for me, it's becoming 
ever more so important to think about at this very moment. I have a five month old daughter who is starting to uh, move around. And when she starts to crawl or walk, I'm gonna have to start lifting these plants off the floor, a lot of them off the floor and putting them in spaces that are out of reach. It also helps if you have uh, pets who are a bit curious uh, about plants and they wanna uh, see what they are about by putting them in their mouths and eating them. Um, a lot of people ask about the um, plants, uh, the pet friendly plants out there. I like to ask, what about all of the, uh, uh, <laughs> the pet friendly, um, uh, the, uh, the plant friendly pets, I will say, that are out there. Luckily, we have um, pets that don't really bother our plants at all. They might bat at some of the leaves of the palms, but they don't really bother them too much. But if you are someone who does have a pet or a child that is getting at your plants, lifting them up higher in your space helps as well. So on both sides here, right into the left, you're seeing that use of pushing greenery uh, on the vertical uh, level just to add that pop of color, that work of art, uh, that bit of uh, that extra lift um, to make sure that you're still able to um, uh, see greenery in every single uh, corner of your home. Uh, again, here on this bookshelf, just little, um, I would say, uh, vignettes of greenery that just make their way in. There's something really beautiful about uh, surrounding books with with plants. I don't know why I tend to gravitate towards that, but whenever I see it, it's, it's something that uh, I truly uh, love. And I do think that old books, um, look, even I know I've seen images of a lot of you using my books as uh, plant stands. Fine, go about it, do it. Um, I, I remember this ep episode of Seinfeld where Kramer came out with a coffee table book that turned into a coffee table. So be it. My, my, <laughs> My, my, plant, my, my plant styling books also work as plant stands as well. But I will say older books do um, find uh, their ways of becoming either plant stands or coasters um, in a lot of people's homes. So maybe that's the connection. Uh, creating levels. It's kind of the same thing when I talk about using the vertical space, but creating levels in your home, like I said, having the ability to think about above eye level and uh, at your feet and how that works and thinking about how you then layer those plants in that particular space. Um, this image here to the, sorry, this image here to the left here, uh, you see uh, this majestic poem actually sitting on the top of this uh, bar. What was important here was this, this space had 20 foot, I believe, Ceiling. So again, like I mentioned earlier, making sure that when you entered the space, it pulled your eye so that you could go more upward, see upward uh, was important. But again, like I'm also mentioned, making sure that that plant was going to get the proper light was uh, key as well. Here um, in my old studio, creating uh, my plant grown. I love a good plant grown, an area for you to go and escape. I'm going to I'm gonna need that at some point. <laughs> when my daughter gets a bit older, I don't need it now. I wanna be around my daughter as much as possible. I'm, I'm sure my wife needs her own little plant thrown to escape me, but um, you, being able to surround yourself in greenery uh, is important. And when it comes to building that throne, it's about creating those levels. You think about, um, a lot of you might not know this, but I'm a, I'm a bit on the taller side uh, you probably can't tell from, from the video, but um, I'm actually 6'5", so I'm a bit taller than you might have thought. But whenever I'm in a photo, it's happened in my entire life since I was probably 10 years old, I was always pushed to the back of the photo so that those in the front could be seen, right? So you have your taller people, your back, and your medium-sized people, and your smaller people in the front. And that's kind of how you want to think about you're leveling when you're bringing in plants, uh, especially when you're creating a plant throne, let's say. You wanna make sure that you have your bigger plants out in the back, your medium-sized plants in front of them, and your smaller plants in the foreground so that every single plant is getting its time in the light. It also helps this way so that you're, you don't forget that smaller plant that is now behind the bigger plant, and now you can't reach to care for it. 
right? So you want to make sure you not only are you styling your plants in a way that looks beautiful, but you're also considering or thinking about how it's going to, uh, how easily accessible it is going to be for you to care for those plants. So I talk about people, uh, well, let's go back to my plant hammock with the macho fern <laughs> over my bed. Beautiful idea. Loved sleeping under it. Did I love watering it? No, I did not. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I, I know it needed to be watered, but I loved the look of it so much. I made an effort to water it. Look, I love my dog. I do. Do I like walking my dog in the winter when it's snowing? Do I like walking my dog in the rain when he doesn't even want to walk, but I got to pull him through all of that walk? No, I don't want to do any of it ever. But you know what? I do it because I love him. And that's why I put that macho fern above my bed because I love the look of it. And I wanted that macho fern to stay alive. So I got up on that bed and watered it when it needed to be watered. So again, when it comes to styling your plants, you wanna make sure that when you are creating that uh, living wall or you're hanging a plant high in your home, make sure you're ready to pull that ladder up once or twice a week to make sure that, that plant gets the uh, required uh, moisture that it needs. Now, a lot of the things I think about when it comes to leveling plants or creating levels in your home or, or creating a, a sort of uh, lush or a particular look in your space as well is thinking about the types of plants, the type of foliage that is going to go against each other. I think that's a really important thing when it comes to plant styling is understanding the, the texture, the color, the shape of foliage next to each other. This image here, I was a big fan of seeing those fan palms, that Chinese fan palm foliage sitting up against the foliage of the fiddle leaf fig or the bird of paradise next to the, uh, the almost burgundy reddish hues of the Rojo Congo that sat in front of it. There's something really nice about that. And, then, and all of the different shapes and textures and colors that can connect all of those plants to create the vibe. It's not just, let me just fill this space with snake plants. <laughs> Let's go all snake plants. I don't know what kind of look that is, but no one would ever do that, I don't think. But you're considering every single plant in the foliage as they are sitting next to each other to create the look that you're going for. And that is important. Um, to the left, I talked about um, pushing. You can actually see how high these ceilings are. When you walk into this living room, kitchen space, you can now see how it pulls your eye upward to see the actual beautiful ceiling here. I, th I think that if all the plants were sitting more floor level, or maybe eye level, you wouldn't be as, uh, I would say, connected to the full space. The same thing goes to the um, image to the right here and the use of the refrigerator as itself as a stand, right? This, um, this ZZ is sitting probably about 12 feet, I believe, away from the window in this particular kitchen. And that ZZ is, is doing what it does tolerating lower light, but it's getting, a, I would say, a good amount of, of um, exposure where it is, but it is providing a look, a lift in right there in that particular corner where a plant couldn't go because there's no room near that fridge. So giving uh, room or adding space or lifting an area by going higher uh, pushes the greenery around and connects you almost as if you are now back in nature. The same thing with this image here, you kind of get that, um, that good, uh, I would say, uh, rule of thirds uh, in this particular image where you have your ZZ in the back up high, you have this whole run of plants that are on top of a console uh, table to the bottom right, and then you have your ferns that are over to the left there. That sort of uh, rule of thirds, that pinning, that triangle, that uh, connects your, or that moves your eye all across the space is very important when it comes to uh, plant styling as well. So that's uh, good to see there. Honestly, I'll say there is no, there is no plant styling. There's no creating a space without understanding that you need a statement plant. 
what is a statement plan? It's a plan that makes a statement. <laughs> it's the thing that when you come into, into a, your home or come into someone else's home, it's that plant that you're like, wow, I need that in my own space. Well, I need that. That is making an impression on me to then leave this space and go out and buy some plants. That's what a statement plant should do. Uh, in, my, in my original um, uh, apartment, the apartment that I had when I first started getting excited about plants, Frank, my fiddle leaf fig, he was going to be my statement plant. I thought it was, I thought it would be interesting to have a tree, a tree growing in my home. When people, friends would come over, they would go, oh my God, you have a tree growing in your home. Why? <laughs> and I would go, because it looks cool and I love it. Um, and I think that's what it is. Something that is really going to set the tone in your space. Here, speaking of fiddle leaf figs, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, his name's Dabito. He has this fiddle leaf fig in his dining room. One single plant that really controls the mood of the space. While that Dracaena sits on the table, it is the fiddle leaf fig that is doing the heavy lifting here. Like I said, it doesn't have to be 10, 20, 100 plants in a space that really brings a, a area to life. It can be one single plant. And the fiddle leaf fig here is making that statement. It's really competing with the, um, the artwork on the wall in the actual fixture on the ceiling, but it does so much. And what's great about that statement plan is over time, as you care for it, it's gonna grow and develop and always be a work in progress. And that's what's really cool about making that statement plant do its thing here. The uh, ficus, I think that's the, Audrey ficus, that is the Audrey ficus. Audrey ficus, tree like, there's a tree in this, <laughs> in this home, but it's doing the heavy lift. It is, it is creating, it is creating that, that connection of nature here in this image, but it's allowing the artwork, this gallery wall to do what it needs to do as well. It's, it's there, it's making its statement, but it's also allowing everything else that is uh, in the art, as you can see in this home, the pops of color, the the abstract in, uh, the abstraction in the artwork the um, how much of it that there is right the the maximum they went to the max I would say with how much they have in this particular area of their home and the Audrey Ficus still stands on its own and looks great in this spot but again consider the light that you have. This uh, Obofolia um, uh, is the only plant in this particular spot, but it is so beautiful, so connected to everything that's actually in this image. It's connected to uh, the little dresser below it with its foliage, with the lines. It's connected to everything I'll say here that has that sort of texture to it, those, those lines that the Obofolia um, has in its in, uh, as has as well, um, but it stands out. It's that pop of color. It's that delicate uh, um, uh, growth that is next to these hard uh, textures that makes it stand um, out amongst everything else. There's just something very beautiful um, about those moments that you can can create with that statement plant. Um, I brought this in here to show that not every statement plant has to be big. It's not about uh, the bigger, the better. It's about what that particular plant does for that area of your home. So you can have many statement plants in your space. It doesn't have to just be one single statement plant. There can be many statement plants, but you're making a statement for that area of your home. That's all I got to say. I know we won't have much time left. I want to make sure I give everyone uh, the proper amount of time to uh, get into the Q&A. So thank you so much. Hilton, thank you so much for that. And thanks to those of you who have chimed in through the chat. I agree with Daniel, you are amazing. And I really appreciate Ellen chiming in saying that the enthusiasm is so infectious. Um, oh. That last plant that you featured is catching a lot of chatter here. Can you tell me more about what that one is and what I need to grow it at my house? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, what, what Erica needs to grow it in her house? 
Susan. Susan's the one who asked, not me. Susan. Susan wants to know about the Orbifolia Calathea. Now, the Calathea family, they all are just a beautiful mixture of uh, plants. They all have uh, wonderful, beautiful foliage. They do require a lot more of your attention. They are moisture lovers. So making sure that you are providing them with the right sort of moisture, the right sort of, right sort of soil to make sure that, that that soil stays more moist. That's important to think about. And also that you're providing them with the right planter. Now I'm not talking about Susan, I think it's Susan, right? Susan, I'm not talking about <laughs> making sure the planter is the right color or, the, or design that matches something else in your home. I'm talking about the right material because there are particular materials that do different things to your plants or to your soil, let's say. So for a plant like the Calathea that wants its soil to stay more moist, you wanna make sure you put it in a pot that is either ceramic glazed or plastic or metal, something that's gonna retain moisture um, so that that soil can stay a bit more on the moist side. So you would never place that type of plant um, like the, the ferns and things like that, that love moisture. You never place them in a pot that is more porous, like a terracotta or clay or stone or, or concrete, right? You wanna make sure that these plants are, are able to hold moisture better. I love that. Along those same lines, we have a question here from Monty about how you provide humidity for those tropical plants and the ferns. So we're gonna start by making sure they're not in unglazed terracotta. And yes, then what are we gonna do? <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna start there. You're gonna also add, um, if, if you know for a fact, you can get uh, uh, so many devices now that can tell you the humidity, the humidity in your home in the area of that plant. And you can then add maybe a humidifier uh, near that plant to make sure it, it gets the humidity that it needs uh, in that particular spot. But you're also gonna start misting that plant as well. That's important. Uh, another thing that can help provide humidity is when you take, let's say a plant, you take your plant and your planter, and let's say you put it on a uh, base tray, a bigger base tray uh, that isn't, that's like more plastic. Get yourself a plastic base tray. Put some stones on top of that base, or on top of that base tray. Fill that base tray with water and then put your plant on top of those stones. As that moisture is evaporating, it will create more humidity for that plant. So that's another way to do that as well. Now, we'll say this. When it comes to bringing the humidifiers or misting your plants, some of us love all different types of plants. We love tropical plants. We love uh, your, 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 all your ferns and things like that. We also love all desert plants, cacti, succulents, plants like that as well. But I will say this, when you are bringing in a humidifier or misting these tropical plants, make sure that you're not misting or bringing a humidifier near your desert plant. If your desert plant, let's say your cactus is kind of stout next to your, your tropical plant and you bring in a humidifier, that humidity is going to uh, kind of hurt those desert plants. So be considerate of that and just think about what plants need the humidity and which plants don't. So at that point, you might want to separate your desert plants from your tropical plants. I love that. Of course. Don asked, um, and I know we got more than one. I tried to keep keep our similar topics, but Don asked about north facing windows, and um, in particular, Don was wondering if using a mirror to reflect ambient light would help, or um, in in his case, Don was asking about minimizing using grow lights to help make sure that energy use is con is the most conscious it can be? For sure. Don, that's a great question. Um, using mirrors to reflect ambient light is a great way, I'll say, uh, to provide, to push more light into those darker corners, in your, uh, I would say, of your home. Um, but if it's north facing, it might, it, it, you're, you're really pushing it. Uh, you're already getting a low uh, amount of exposure already. Uh, then when you reflect that, it's now then reduced a bit more. Um, so that's 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 what I was saying. It is a good idea, but um, you have to think about the the intensity of exposure that is then being reflected from a north facing window. As I said, we had a couple of folks chiming in with north facing windows, and I think that the answer ties to a couple of other questions we've gotten here sure. about grow lights. 
what are your favorites? What should we know when we're looking? How do you start? Is there something different or do you just go to a store and say, I want a grow bulb? <laughs> uh, great question. Uh, yeah, I mean, when it comes to grow lights, um, I don't want to push you into a particular brand to get. Um, uh, there are so many great ones uh, out there for sure. Um, I will say the one thing that is is helpful is to make sure that when you do get a grow light bulb, whatever it is, or a fixture, whatever it is, making sure that you keep it at a particular distance away from your foliage. It can still, like most lights, uh, uh, but light-wise, it can burn the foliage of your plant, right? So you want to be aware of that. But you also want to be aware of, again, like I mentioned earlier, the time, how much time you're giving that particular plant under that grow ball. Um, a lot of them are going to be a mixture of either red or blue light together um, that they create this almost magenta type light. Those particular grow lights are for producing more, let's say, uh, flowers, blooms, or fruiting plants, right? Uh, that sort of temperature ball. But a lot of them will be, will be your clean white uh, exposure, which is when we're talking about Kelvin, uh, will be closer to like 5,400 to 5,600 Kelvin. So you could probably even go to a hardware store and get a daylight bulb, put that into a clamp light, maybe attach that to some something in your home and have that going for about 12 to 16 hours in that plant that's near there. Uh, as long as it's getting, if it's broad enough or the strength of that bulb is bright enough to hit most of your plant or all of your plant, you should be good. But if they can't get all every single side, then you're going to need multiple grow lights, right? The one thing I also will uh, say that I'm not a fan of, I'm not a fan of that cool light during the night, right? Like I want my home to feel a bit warmer. Warmer light is more relaxing, right? Um, so what I would do is, so what we have done is we would always attach our grow lights to a timer. So that, that, that grow light kicked on around 1 a.m. and then would stay on for 12 to 16 hours throughout the day. So by the time my wife or myself came home from work, it was already off again. And those plants got all the good daylight or, or uh, artificial light that they required. And I didn't have to sit at 8 p.m. while I'm trying to relax and uh, recover from the day have to sit with that bright white light shining near me. So um, that's something to consider as well. I love that. And I also love the idea of putting it on a timer so that it can be something that moves more into the set and forget. Um, exactly. exactly. We got a lot of questions about how much time it takes to water. And I know you've talked about different species um, needing different things. We've also gotten a couple of questions about fertilization and if there's a rule of thumb for fertilizing house plants. For sure. Um, so let's let's uh, go back to watering plants. Um, again, when it comes to watering plants, I will say this: most individuals, when it comes to killing plants, kill their plants because of overwatering. Overwatering tends to be the one, the major reason why most plants are are, are suffering out there, right? Um, I'm not I'm not someone who is uh, uh, who hasn't um, who hasn't overwatered a plant. I've overwatered a few plants myself. It's because we love them so much. We're like, you probably need more water. Right? <laughs> why not uh, give them more moisture? But you have to be very considerate when it comes to the moisture that you're providing your plant. I always say it's better to underwater than overwater. Like I talked about with the peace lily, your pothos. A lot of these plants are very forgiving. They actually have tells where they uh, kind of hint, hey, I need a drink. And, and let's say you underwater the plant and it's the foliage starts to turn, let's say, a bit brown on the edge of the, of the leaf. That brownie spot that's going to happen on the edge of that leaf is going to happen and then it's going to stop once you give that plant moisture. But if you overwater a plant, that leaf, the foliage on that plant will start to turn yellow and it's going to go fully yellow and then that leaf is going to fall off that plant. There is no saving that foliage. You can cut out a little brown spot in the leaf, but once that leaf starts to turn yellow, it's dead. It's going to fall off at a certain point. So when it comes to watering your plants, it's not about, when you talk about set it and forget it, 
it's not about setting a schedule. And I know a lot of you are like, no, <laughs> I, I order my plants every Saturday morning. What do you mean I can't set a schedule? Because you can't. Because if, plant, if you set a schedule for your plants, you're going to end up overwatering or underwatering plants instantly. Because spring and summer, when you had that plant on that seven day schedule, it was great. The sun was coming in, it was heating up that, that pot, your soil was drying out every seven days maybe. But come winter, when it's cooler in your home, the sun isn't as high, so it's not as hot as it comes to your home. The soil in that pot isn't heating up as, as often or as quickly, and your soil is gonna stay wet longer. So now that seven day schedule is, or that seven day dry out is now 10 days, maybe 12 days. So you have, to, you have to think of every single plant at that point as its own little thing. You have to think about the soil that's in that pot. So it's always important to check the moisture of the soil in your plant versus just going on a schedule. And I will say the best thing um, that I've ever done, I used to use my finger, like I said, I would, I would, <laughs> I would knock on, my mom would knock on the fruit or put it up to her ear. Someone once told me, I mean, they were so, uh, in, in the world of plants that they could take a pot and they could hit the pot and they could tell how, by the sound, how dry the soil was. I'm not on that level uh, yet, so, but I can stick my finger in soil and test the, the moisture out. But I found that it was better for me to get a moisture meter and push that in the soil to let that gauge whether or not my soil was wet, dry, or moist. So that is helpful. Another thing I'll say is too, it's also based on the, 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 the area where you have your plant set up. So let's say we had two fiddle leaf figs. We had, uh, I love, love fiddle leaf figs, like you tell them. You have one fiddle leaf fig, same size. They're the same size, they're in the same type of pot. One's in a southern facing window, one's in a northern facing window. While they are the same type of plant, same size, same size pot, same amount of soil, they're not gonna be on the same watering schedule. Because like I said, your southern facing window is getting more exposure than your northern facing window. So the soil in that southern facing fiddle leaf fig pot is gonna dry up much faster, which means that plant is gonna need to be watered more. So it's all about that. So it's always about checking the moisture of your soil first. Now, once you're someone who is really into it and seeing your plants grow, you're gonna to have to fertilize your plants at some point. Now, let's say you went out and purchased the plant last spring or summer, whenever you purchase a plant over the last year, let's say in the last year, you don't need to fertilize it until this coming spring. Fertilization happens between spring and summer. That's growth season. That's when you wanna fertilize and start to add more, more uh, let's say food to your soil so your plant can eat that food and push out new growth. Now, when you get that plant new from a plant shop, it has already been fertilized. They've been fertilizing that plant. That soil is what we call nutrient rich. So for the next year, you're gonna water it. You're gonna water that soil. And those nutrients are going to be escaping out every single water, right? So after a year, it's gonna be up to you to then provide it with more nutrients. And that can happen through providing it with all the different types of fertilizers out there, whether it's a liquid fertilizer, whether it's a capsule fertilizer, uh, like an almost time fertilizer, like a, a, a slow release fertilizer, or if it's just taking your plant out of its pot, scraping away some of that old nutrient poor soil and putting in fresh nutrient rich soil. And that's kind of how you fertilize your plants. But I will say this as well, while you do want to fertilizer, fertilize in spring and summer when your plant is actively growing, that is it. It's the actively growing portion. So if you are seeing a plant in your home right now, actively growing, you can fertilize that plant right now to encourage it to grow more. So while a lot of plants go dormant come fall, winter, if your plant is actively growing, you can still provide it with fertilizer. Excellent. While you're talking fiddle leaf figs, <laughs> um, someone was inspired by you to add a gorgeous fiddle leaf fig, which is doing beautifully and taking off but gravity is starting to have its effect. So, what How? to do about drooping branches? 
I'm so happy that uh, your plant is thriving and you got to the point where your, your fiddly fig is like, I can't hold these leaves anymore. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome place to be in, even though it might be a bit stressful. Um, I will say this, once it gets to that point, you're gonna probably have to help it. You have to help it uh, uh, hold its weight, right? So you might wanna tie it up. The one thing that I've been doing uh, for a lot of my plants that start to grow out of control or to uh, manage how far out they try to expand themselves in my home, I'll tie them up with a bit of uh, gardening Velcro. Gardening Velcro honestly is like a lifesaver. Um, they sell it at any hardware store or online. You cut a piece, strap it around a bunch of, uh, of your branches, and then it'll force a plant that is sticking out like this to now grow like this. And in that process of holding it up, over time, it should also kind of grow into that shape that you're kind of holding it into. Um, but you don't want to, you want to train it to hold that position, but you don't want it to become dependent on the things that are helping it grow upward. So when you see a, a plant growing in a pot, you might buy it from a nursery, and it's growing in a pot and they have a stake, some sort of pole helping to hold the, the base of that plant up, that pole isn't to, is it there for, for it to stay forever? It's there to help it as it grows and develop. And once it starts to uh, have the ability to grow on its own, you wanna remove that pole. You wanna remove that, um, that uh, gardening Velcro to allow that plant to be able to hold its own weight. So that would, uh, that's what I would suggest. Or you can take um, uh, pitcher uh, wire, like, um, fish, like fishing line, anything like that. And you can pull that, attach it to one of your branches and then pull that to another branch or maybe to the ceiling and attach it to your ceiling, almost like you're hanging art. Um, I've done that where I would take those little small hooks uh, that you use for hanging art and I would screw that into a wall and then take a, a, a visible art uh, wire and tie it to a branch and tie it to that um, hook to give my plants a, 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 a bit of a lift without seeing the, the wire, let's say there as well. I love that. We have a couple of questions here about clipping um, plants to propagate them, and especially with interest in low light plants starting from clippings. Uh, that is easy. <laughs> low, light, <laughs> low light plants. Every single uh, low light plant that I uh, talked about in my discussion uh, are very easy to propagate, except for that rattlesnake calathea when it comes to water propagation. Now, um, your pothos, I talked about your pothos, that entire family of pothos are also easy to propagate. I'm sure many of you have golden pothos. You've gotten them as a cutting or you saw them in someone's home growing in some mason jar. I remember as a kid seeing them in my grandmother's house, just hanging in every, or dangling or cascading down every single surface. Um, so that entire family is pretty uh, easy to propagate. Um, but understanding that while those plants can tolerate low light once they're in soil, when it comes to growth of propagating a plant and water propagation uh, in low light, your growth of roots is going to take a longer period of time. The more light you provide a cutting, the more you'll see their roots push out faster. So if, you put in, if you're putting that low light tolerant plant, that cutting of a low light tolerant plant in a low light spot in your home, it's gonna take much longer to see those roots develop. And just be patient because across the board, it takes time for roots to develop, but stay patient and you will see that root start to develop over time. Uh, like I said, the dumb cane is a great one to propagate. Your ZZ plant, your snake plants, um, your Chinese evergreens, all these plants are, 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 are fairly easy to propagate um, via uh, water propagation. They're, again, like I said, it's going to take a bit more time if you're propagating them in lower light. I love that. We've gotten a couple of great questions about um, how to select plants, and particularly Nicole Jones asked a fabulous question here about what is something that you look for in terms of a plant store? Or Ooh. if there are plant 
stores you know of in the DMV, I know, or or up in your neck of the woods, though it may not be an everyday trek to Baltimore, well, sure. especially for our friends in Virginia who practice sustainable plant harvesting? That is a, that is a great question. Isn't Nicole, it? Right, Nicole? That's a great question. Um, man, you, gosh, you have me. Um, sustainable plant. I'm, in my area, I will say, I can't really speak. There's some plant shops in the D.C. area that I like. I don't know about the sustainable I don't know about the sustainable growing, um, but uh, Little Leaf and also Rewild are two of the plant shops that whenever I'm in DC, I like to uh, check out and see what they have um, in stock. But here in, in Baltimore and in, in my area, uh, Valley View Farms is one of the best. They uh, really care about what's happening uh, as far as their plants. And also the spot called... <laughs> One of the reasons I'm laughing is because I'm about to say, all right, they're called Little Greenhouse, uh, The Little Greenhouse uh, in Kearney. But the reason I'm laughing is because when I went in there, uh, I first met the guys who own the shop. I was like, I don't think these guys want to sell, sell me any of these plants. <laughs> and the reason I'm laughing is because I told my wife, I was like, if I ever owned a plant shop, I would probably be like them where I was so, like, they are very uh they 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 want everyone leaving with the plants to know exactly how to care for their plants they hold on to the plant until the very moment where they know for a fact you are going to care for it <laughs> properly and that's kind of how i see myself as a, a plant lover i think if i owned the shop i would i would ask for uh, i would probably do background checks on a lot of people <laughs> Uh, you know, when you when you adopt a pet, they, they make you do those background checks. I think I would do background checks on individuals who are trying to find my plants. But um, I think I think that's kind of what you want when it comes to uh, a plant shop. When you're thinking about plant shops, you want to think not only about how they are uh, impacting the environment, right? And think about the environment, but they're also considering in, in thinking about the environment, they're thinking about the their customer, thinking about the individuals who are actually purchasing these plants and making sure that they're not and i can definitely say this about the guys at um little greenhouse they're not considering the dollar right of how much uh they're going to make off of that plant because if they were they would let everyone come and buy every single plant they had and hopefully they kill them then they have to come back and buy more um they're thinking about making sure you leave and you have that plant and you never come back to buy that type of plant again to replace the plant that you kill. They want to make sure that you are uh, supplied with the tools to make sure that you are going to, um, or that they can hopefully set you up for success. And I think that is important, making sure that the individuals who work that plant shop are available to uh, provide you with that information that they are, are that so that when you come to that plant shop and you say, hey, I have a eastern facing window that uh, is six by eight feet tall. I have this much space for plants. And that individual who works at that plant shop can provide you with all the information on the types of plants that can then thrive in that space. I think that's what's important. And then, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you really want to get into uh, the weeds, <laughs> that's a plant fun. Uh, if you want to really get into it, um, then you can think about like what, like where are they sourcing their plants from, right? Um, there aren't many like native plant growing plant shops here. I know uh, whenever I visit a lot of the uh, the plant shops in the south, you can find a lot of obviously native plant plant stores that are doing that there. But it's difficult to do that here, right? So um, I would just say just think about the individuals who own the shop and what and what their their goal is. Right, like what what they're thinking about. If they're really considering you um, and, and your home and how uh, they can help set you up for success, I think that's important. That's fabulous. Well, I know we have been going for a while. We have so many fantastic questions. I'd love to pose two more that I think. Um, hit at themes that have been asked by more than one person. Sure. We have questions about herbs as 
house plants and what you recommend if there are any particular tr tricks to think about with the edible plants yeah i mean uh, light uh for one um having the right type of light in your home is going to be of the utmost importance when it comes to growing uh herbs or fruit trees or anything that would typically want to just be outside and growing outside right um i've had a lot of success and this is just me um growing rosemary and basil um indoors um uh the one thing and this is and this is what i'll say if you have those uh hydroponic um systems they are great for stuff like that as well but if you think about how those operate it's because they are getting the right moisture that they need and they're also getting a ton of light bright even light right not direct it's not the intensity of direct sun is bright even light so if you if you think about that when it comes to caring for those types of plants, making sure they stay well well um, uh, moist, because if you were growing them outside, you probably water them uh, every single day to make sure that they got the moisture they need because of the sun being out all day and drying up that soil. So you're going to want to consider those sorts of things. So um, I haven't tried many outside of the uh, hydroponic system uh, uh, that we have, but um, rosemary and basil have uh, been pretty simple but again when i say simple it's because we were, we're putting them in the right type of light and making sure that i'm water so i don't want to get i don't want to give some get someone give someone the wrong impression that they can just go and buy a rosemary plant and they're going to have success right out the gate no just making sure you have a, a good amount of bright and direct light and uh, you're watering it fairly frequently um you should see some success i love that we had a couple of questions about keeping your plants clean both bugs or fungus or mold soil maintenance sure. a couple of folks talking about dusting and whether misting could be one way to help that keeping your plants from getting dusty yeah um misting not so much um I'm kidding dusting i would say not, not so much it's the routine maintenance right that is going to be important especially when it comes to uh, keeping the plants clean, but also um, uh, preventing any sort of bugs or at least bug infestation, right? So when it comes to bringing the natural shine back to your foliage, um, I, I tend to tell folks and myself, remind myself every other week, every three weeks to go in and be prepared to spend, because I have a lot of plants. I'm prepared to spend three to four hours wiping down leaves, right? Like I've I've signed up for this. It's it's what I'm going to need to do. My dog smells bad, but you know what? I gotta take him to get a bath. Oh what? I gotta we gotta we gotta fight the fight um, to get him in a tub and to stay in that tub. But that's the same thing with your plants. You got you got to get in there. You got to make sure you wipe you know, you wipe that foliage down. And I and I think it's an, it it helps not only remove that layer of dust, and you think about that layer of dust that is accumulating over that time, but that layer of dust also creates a buffer between the exposure, that light source, and the actual um, tissue of your, of, your, of your plant, right? The tissue of that leaf. So if you're someone who's already in a position that you don't have a lot of light coming into your home, you definitely don't want a lot of dust blocking light from your plant, right? So remove that dust. I like to take a damp uh, cloth um, and just wipe every single leaf off. Uh, and if I have uh, any sort of, let's say, um, fertilite, because sometimes uh, when you buy a plant from a plant shop, it might have like fertilite, like dry fertilizer from like spray fertilizer on the leaves. It kind of looks like um, white and chalky um, on the leaves. You can wipe them off with like mild dish soap as well. But also, um, I don't know, just like an old wives tale, but um, is it uh, lemon juice? Taking a, a lemon and like squeezing it and using that and wiping down your leaves can help as well. Um, but I think the one thing when it comes to bug prevention is that sort of time, that time spent with that plant. So while you're there wiping down your leaves, you're already noticing what's going on with your plant by being in the plant itself. 
So when you're wiping down the leaf, you're like, oh, there's no bugs in here. I'm going to keep, I'll keep wiping and you keep wiping. And then the more you spend time with that plant, the more you are on top of preventing yourself from getting any sort of pest. Now, a lot of people deal with different types of pests, mealybugs, scale, but across the board, I think what everyone love, wants to know about is gnats. I was like, how do I get rid of gnats? And gnats are uh, produced because of wet soil, right? Very damp, heavy, wet soil. And that's kind of what you want to stay away from. So if you're someone who has, let's say, uh, I think it was Susan who loved that orbifolia um, and wanted to bring it into our home, a plant that wants its soil to stay evenly moist, you want to make sure that you're putting it uh, you you want to give your plant the best sort of moisture, best sort of opportunity to get the moisture it needs. But if you want to avoid pests like gnats, you also want to make sure you're watering it properly so that it doesn't create that. So gnats love the, the wetness or the dampness of the top soil. So what you can start to do is water your soil from the bottom. So basically bottom watering your plants, placing it, let's say, in uh, like, like filling your the bottom of your, filling your sink up, let's say, with about three to four inches of water, and then taking your pot and then placing it in that water, letting it sit in there for about 10 minutes and then pulling it out. So now only the bottom of your pot, the inside soil is now getting wet. The top soil is actually staying dry and that can help prevent uh, those gnats from showing up in your life. I also tell folks, you can also get like uh, cedar chips, cedar sawdust, and sprinkle that on the top of your soil as well. Um, that's a, a natural uh, bug repellent. So um, just think about that. So when it comes to care, wiping down your leaves, rotating your plants, and also just being aware of any sort of bugs is, uh, is important. Well, Hilton, thank you so much for spending a truly delightful evening with us. And um, I'm so sorry we couldn't be in person, but I'm thrilled that you will be coming to visit Hillwood soon. And I hope that everyone who has joined us this evening, if you're in the DC area, please come visit Hillwood. We are open Tuesday through Sunday, 10 to 5. There is lots up on our website, and I hope at the very least I will see you all next week for the second program in our Great Homes and Gardens series. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Good luck with uh, the plant care. Um, I will say this one, one last time. It isn't um, a thing when it comes to individuals having brown thumbs or green thumbs. There's no such thing as a green thumb. Individuals like myself who consider themselves having green thumbs, let's say, are just people who have put the time and effort in. That's all it is. You put the time and effort in, you will see the results and the success happen. I truly enjoyed uh, being able to share a bit of my story, a bit of my uh, process, and um, I hope that uh, you all see uh, a lot of results uh, over the next few weeks. And uh, just stay, hold, hold on tight. Spring is coming. Your plants, your plant, your plants will uh, are waiting for spring, like we all are. But just hold on tight. Just keep watering them. Push them closer to your windows. But make sure your foliage isn't touching the glass of those windows. You don't want to get the the foliage uh, frostbitten by those cold, cold windows. That's something to be aware of as well. Um, Aaron, I probably should stop talking because I can continue to talk and talk <laughs> about plants. But again, I appreciate it. I'm going to be at Hillwood sometime this spring. So I hope I get to see some of you in person. If you do see me, please uh, come up and talk to me. Uh, you can ask me any questions you might have uh, on your mind. So um, all of you take care of yourselves. Uh, and I like to say stay safe, but of course, stay wild. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hilton. Have a great night. You do the same. Take care.